Yeah, I'm happy to be here too and happy to be here with all of you, all of you as experts. And so that's kind of my hope is that anytime I'm in a group or with anyone that that um, inner knowing can come through because we all have this, um, every single one of us, especially if you're raising a teenager right now. So some of it's about reminding and supporting each other and um, yeah, in that truth that we, we have the answers and we also need each other. And that's why we're all here. And that's how we get to do these types of events. So I'm happy to be here. And yeah, the Teen Whisperer sort of came about this term um, at one point in my career when all of my clients were teenagers and their parents. So families raising teens. And um, it continues to be just, I think really um, misunderstood age and stage. And so my hope is to offer new perspectives that open our heart space. We can get kind of locked into the head stuff or the school stuff or the to do's or what it should be like. And so perhaps this will be an experience where, yeah, we come back a little bit to this heart space and see with that lens. So um, that's what I'm here to offer. It's such an honor to be here. And yeah, we can dive in with questions or we can, I can kind of talk a little bit about what I'm seeing with teens and what a lot of families are going through right now and sort of some of my perspectives on that, if that's helpful. Yeah, maybe let's start with that. And um, yeah, and kind of how you came to be where you are and your perspective of what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, a lot of the stuff we'll talk about has kind of been happening for a while now. And I feel like a lot of it is also really fast forwarded or maybe intensified over the last few years. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of teens are they're kind of aware that they don't have to go to school because we did things differently over the last few years, right? A lot of things can be digital now and even starting to realize, hey, this homework, this work isn't feeling super relevant. I'm not really connected to it. It doesn't really fit with what I see my future or even my presence and like my present moment now. A lot of teams are really honoring, valuing their time and not seeing some of what they're being asked to do as valuable for their time and their energy. And, and I actually think this is a really beautiful awakening we're coming into. A lot of us really kind of just did the things we were supposed to do. Some stuff was suppressed along the way. We just like did it, ABC, check, check, check. And we're seeing now that's not necessarily the way. It's not the only way. And in fact, for some people, it really doesn't serve them. <laughs> so um, this is what I'm seeing with a lot of young people. They're questioning this way being like, I don't know. I don't know if this is working. I mean, if we look around, it'd be kind of hard to argue that it is working. So um, maybe there's something to learn here for us. Maybe this is a time to slow down. And so one of the ways I like to do this is when teens so often say things like, this is stupid, this homework is pointless, I'm never going to use this. Um, instead of shutting that down and saying, well, you just have to do it, my approach is about, yeah, is pointless or like it is dated. You you probably won't use this. What do you wish school was like? Or sometimes I even say, what's the hardest part? Like, what's the worst part? Which is the worst class? We're so programmed, I think, to stay away from these negative conversations, but it can become really negative when we're in that toxic positivity headspace. Because then there doesn't there's no space for teens to really share where they're at. And what we're left with is then teens that feel alone in their experience. And actually things might have to get harder for the adults to really hear them. So if we lean in to those moments, and when we do, we actually get to be part of that journey. And what I see over and over again is teens going, by the end of it, they're talking about what they love and what they wanna do and all the things that they wish things could be or that they wanna create or that they'd love life to be. And so it's a really beautiful process when we can pause long enough to remember okay, just because they hate math doesn't mean they're failing and they're going to live in my basement until they're 50 or whatever the fear is. It's like, oh yeah, of course they don't like this class or this teacher or this work, right? And getting curious and asking more about that. So that's the one, you know, one kind of example of what I'm seeing right now and what's going on right now and how I'm experiencing engaging with young people about their experience. Well, and specifically what we were, we talked about uh, offline when we were talking about tonight is talking about how um, we can take these conflicts and use them as opportunities to connect with our kids. Um, so if you guys have any specific conflicts or issues that you've been working with within your family, please raise your hand or put it in the chat 
And we'd love to like dig down a little specifically on that, provide you some strategies or even just ways of looking at it. And when I say we, I mean, Kirsten, I mean. <laughs> um, so if anything comes to mind, please feel free to raise your hand or put something in the chat. One thing that had come up um, that was sent to me was talking specifically an, an issue that someone was having over and over with their child was uh, their phone and that it was a constant struggle. It was a constant tug of war of asking to get off, getting on. I need to be on it for school. I need to talk to this person. And they just couldn't, it, it just, as soon as they walked in the room with the phone, they felt like the tension already started. How do you deal with that? Yeah, this is, we're all in this experience with technology, right? It's like, we're all, or at least most of us in, in some way, in most of us, many ways, we're connected to our phones and maybe an out of balance way, whether it be for work, working overtime, for homework, or some of the more positive ways, which is connecting with friends or connecting for calls like this. But sometimes there is an imbalance, right? If someone is, I see teens in particular with their phones um, as it's a tool to be connected, right? And it was maybe really supportive during the past few years or whatever. And now it's become a little bit of a pattern. And if we don't have awareness with some of these patterns then it becomes, it can become even more imbalanced. However, when we just take the phone away, right? And use it as a punishment or a privilege, which I'm not saying it's not that, but when it's only that, it's just like, now you have to give it to me because you did something you know, wrong. Um, it becomes a power dynamic and a power struggle. Also what's happening there is your teens like, I can't believe my parent or guardian doesn't understand how important this is for me. This is how I connect with my friends. This is how I stay connected. These are my support systems, or this is how I do my homework. And so it is really tricky right now because it has all these layers. And I like to really take a step back and sort of reassess, depending on the age of the child, depending on the dynamics, make sure that I'm asking questions that are going to raise their awareness make sure the right you know, safety things are on and all that again, depending on age and make sure they know what the expectations are and the rules and the guidelines with how to work with this because this is a tool. Um, I've heard someone and I can't remember who said this but there's this concept of you can even invite a young person to be on a family group chat at younger ages to even practice because the thing is these phones are in our lives and so it's important for young people to know how to work with them as tools with awareness and how to navigate. We also want to make sure that our relationship is strong so that when something is not going great on the phone, they know they can come to someone safe to share and get that help if they need any support with something, whether it be like a mean comment or confusing homework or something more difficult. And so that's really important too. When it's seen as just, you didn't do your chore, give me your phone. All that really does is create disconnection. And then we risk not knowing what's going on with them. Um, and just that kind of becoming snowball effect, if that makes sense. Lisa, I, did I see a thing in the chat? Yep. Um, so the question in the chat was around, um, so my child doesn't like his teacher, and so he keeps talking back in class. Do you have any thoughts about approaching that? Oh, it makes me so curious. I know a few young people dealing with this right now. It makes me curious what's going on in the class. Hmm. Like what, what is it for that person? And I, and I know teachers have so much on their plates right now, right? It's like everyone has different needs and sometimes there's 40 kids, 40 young people in a classroom to be, you know, supporting. And so this is, this is tricky, I think on all parts and as the parent or guardian and certainly for the child. Um, I'm curious, yeah, what's happening for them leaning in and being like, oh, what's, what's going on? What's it like for you? Um, because maybe it's the way the teacher calls on people randomly, or maybe it could be any. I've heard a lot of different things over the past couple of years with um, students having challenges with their teachers. And there is this kind of unfair expectation that teachers A, have all the time in the world and all the resources and all this, which is not true. And also an expectation that kids should just do what the teacher says and kind of deal with it when really sometimes um, that adult is under a lot of stress. And maybe there is something that you know, isn't landing well for the kids and is interfering with the learning process potentially, whether it be boring material or um, like a, a tone that's hard for some sensitive young people to be in. 
or it's a social dynamic, right? We know that with this age group, the social stuff is really deeply meaningful. And this is ingrained in us as humans. It's for survival. You know, we need our community, our, our tribe, our community, our village, all of that. This is important. And so that's, that's what young people are, are going through right now. And they're going through so many changes and do I have the right sneakers and all this stuff. So it could be, could be anything. And so I, I get really curious, like, oh, what's happening for you? What's it like to be you? Instead of just, we have to respect our teachers. We need to just do what she says or whatever. Cause we don't actually want to encourage young people to just do what other people tell them. We want to encourage young people to listen to that inner voice and be under and have discernment and have awareness and have their own compass um, to navigate stuff as they get older in the world. So do you feel like, so let's say it is the tone of the teacher that they just don't respond to that. Mm -hmm. And that's not may perhaps not something that can be changed. Yeah. Do you feel just having that curious conversation and then maybe talking about what they, they sh can be doing in class is, is how to get to that next step. Cause at some point you just, don't, you don't want them talking out in class. Right. Yeah. So I tend to spend as much time as needed in the curiosity validation phase, if the, if the child, if the young person's willing to share, if the teenager's open to that. And so it might look like when it's like, oh, I heard there's like some talk back, which is a phrase I'm actually not super fond of because it's really just someone being like, hey, you know, like this doesn't sit well for me or they're, they don't know how to manage that emotion and, or that feeling or that moment. And how could they, they're, maybe 14 or 16 or something still learning. And so many adults don't always know how to. So having our expectations in check for this developmental stage. And then also, yeah, maybe it's a, a question like, what's happening for you in class? What's that like for you? And they say, well, this teacher is not very nice or mean, and they always call on me and I don't know the answer and it's embarrassing or whatever, some sort of story. And then it's like, oh, of course. Oh my gosh. I can imagine being like kind of nervous or Oh, is that what it's like, you know, and in more time in that so that they feel heard and seen in their experience of being in that classroom. And it might be days, it might be an hour, it might be five minutes, it really depends on, and you'll know, you know, your child. And so whatever they're willing to kind of offer and give. And then it's like, man, I wish we could change your teacher, you know, go into the wishes. I wish we could I wish no one talked meanly to anyone. You know, we can be in that space with them because that's, that's often true. Like we wish we could do something. And then eventually we might get to a place to be like, okay, if we can't change a teacher, we have to get up early and there's all these things we can't change. Like, I wonder what we can do if anything. And they may go, I don't know. And that's okay. At least there's been that space for them to be heard and seen and understood in what their experience is and what their version of their reality is and what they're going through and how hard that that is because the only thing harder than a hard experience is being alone in that hard experience and we know from like the aces test that in our hard moments if we have support that matches it then it's much more manageable but when the the, the stress is up here the obstacle or the tough moment and the support's like way over way down here it's so much harder and also we're not learning those skills, co-regulation, communication, all that stuff that comes to these conversations is really heart-centered open conversations where we're not blaming the child for having a problem with the teacher, right? Because that doesn't help. Yeah, we do have, and that is just kind of leading into this next question in the chat, it's just maybe touching on, I know some of us are familiar with the ACEs test, but um, just for everyone else, maybe just kind of, I think that is a little, lends a little background, if you can explain that. Oh, sure. I'm trying to even remember what it stands for at this point. I just, because I remember it just as this kind of like support meet the stress, support meet the stress. Like this is helpful. It basically is, I mean, you can even Google it and you sort of can go through it for yourself and even um, do your own scoring. It's basically like how many tough things have you gone through in life and how much support have you had in life? And you get, we get to see where we're at with that. And, and for, for those of us, I think my understanding of it is those of us that have the support meeting those stressors, we've been able to get through them in a different way, or maybe in a more integrated way. Um, but certainly Google that if anyone's interested um, to look more into that. Uh, and, and again, 
feel free to raise your hand. I had a question. Um, my daughter has a group of friends that accidentally leaves her out of things. She gets hurt, they apologize, and then it happens again. I don't want to dump on her friends, but I also don't want her to be a punchy bag. What should I do? Oh, yeah. It sounds like there's already been some great communication with it. I think one of the hard things is seeing people we love be sad, get disappointed, and have to learn these like hard, I don't want to call them life lessons, but just have these tough experiences in life. Because a lot of times our growth comes from these tough experiences, but it's so hard and it's so hard to watch people in them. And so, yeah, it's a delicate balance. I mean, it really kind of depends on the circumstances. Um, sometimes it's asking questions about it. Like, what do you like about this group? What feels good for you? What doesn't feel good for you? What's it, you know, what's it like? I, I, I think I even said that just a little while ago, like, what's it like to be you? What's that like? And sometimes it's in the car or over food. It doesn't have to be so serious, although sometimes it is. And meeting a teenager in that seriousness is, is good too, because um, they, need their, they need the guidance in the safe space to be able to talk about how these things feel. And we've, you know, I think we've maybe had a couple generations of shying away from some of that. We've thought maybe that will make things worse. And what we're seeing is actually when we're able to communicate and really feel with that support, that we realize we can actually, we're strong enough to be in these feelings and in these experiences. It's like, oh, I can handle this because someone's right next to me being like, we got this, but without skipping over it all, just like, it's no big deal. So kind of similar to before, it's like learning more about the dynamics, learning more about what it's like for her, what she wishes it was like, what's hard about it. And then if we ever want to share some wisdom, um, one of the ways that I like to offer that is as an option, because sometimes teens want to know nothing about what we might know about it or have experience or whatever wisdom we have. And some really do. And so it's like, if you'd like, I'm happy to share stuff that I learned, but also totally fine. Um, if that's not welcome, because sometimes it is them just going through that path, figuring it out kind of on their own, but hopefully with support. So we shouldn't go yell at those girls. <laughs> no, but if you, I love that because if your teen is really, really mad about something, it's okay to be like, yeah, and stomp your feet and like throw a stick or whatever, you know, like whatever is safe and also moves energy through. Cause actually what we know about frustration and anger is that it helps us move through the grief and the sadness actually it helps to like burn it up. It's more of like the fire energy and it can help us move through that. And learning how to be angry or frustrated in a, in a balanced way is also another really underrated skill, I think, um, and that a lot of us like shy away from and, and don't know, you know, how to be that ourselves. So how to model, how to embody like those the frustrations and the feelings and the sadness in a way that, yeah, allows that process to happen instead of get stuck somewhere or be, you know, get kind of stuck and then have it be that, that thing I don't talk about or that fear that it's gonna happen with every friend group. We can be in it in that moment, be curious, then something might shift. I Especially see a hand friend. raised. Oh, two hands raised. I think, uh, Amy, you were, you were there first. Um, feel free. Sure. Uh, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, you too. I, I'm no longer, parenting teens both of my kids are are young adults now but um I think you've touched on something super important that I think might be worth exploring a little more and that is I think the most valuable lessons that I've learned in parenting my kids well I am learning I should say because I ain't there yet but is that you know it used to be that I would jump to wanting to solve the problem immediately. And I think what you're speaking to is so beautiful because what you're suggesting is engage in the conversation. Don't jump to solve the problem. Right. And allow your own kids to, to do that, you know, through a process. Mm -hmm. But could you speak a little bit to like in the heat of the moment, whether it's anger or fear or, you know, 
how do we as parents step back and say, okay, I'm just going to be in the moment. I'm not going to say, well, don't you think you should, or have you tried, or why don't you do this? Or can you just speak a little bit about how we might just take a breath and step back a bit? Well, that's it. It's like remembering to breathe. It's like the key there. And it's so simple, but it's not necessarily easy because when we have that fear come up of like what could happen or this is sad or scary or whatever it is, then it's boom, immediately like we're trying to fix it. And I feel like what you spoke to is even just what we've kind of, what we're growing through. We might've come from this place of it's not a big deal to let me fix it for you. And now we're in this, I'll be with you in this phase, like kind of generationally. And of course that doesn't mean hundred percent that, that way in certain generations, but we've kind of, I think evolved into this place and we're now, we can hold it together. I'll hold this with you. I'll be with you in this instead of that there's something to fix or that it's not a big deal. It's, it's just what it is. And so um, to your point of how do we breathe and just pause, that's it. It's like, how do we remember to breathe? And so there's a few ways to remember that is practicing breathing when we're not in a stress moment, right? It's just coming back to that any moment, any time we want and like getting the actual, the actual breathing. Yeah. Just being yeah. aware of our breath and practicing it at any point in time, any point in the day. And then in those moments, we're more likely to remember because we've had that practice or we can sit down because if we think about the body or put our feet on the ground, right. Or something like this, if everything's that gives the message basically to the brain that things are at least okay. We don't have to run. And so then that, that can remind the body that it's not an emergency. This person's having an experience and a feeling and I can actually respond instead of react. However, yeah, getting to that place where you remember to sit down and remember to breathe. I think that's the hardest second. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So Thank that would you. be one idea is to practice other times and also know what our triggers are. It's like, does, is fear too hard for me? Um, what, what are the, the experiences, the feelings, and what are our own teenage experiences that make us go, <gasps> and just knowing those so that we can kind of be aware of them. Thank you. Yeah, thank I love that question. Thank you. We had another uh, raised hand, Asta. Um, hello. I have my husband here too, Lennis. And I love it. He had a question. Um, thank you for the wonderful session. Um, we have uh, two children, well, three if you count me. Um, and uh, uh, a daughter's 15, son is 12. Um, daughter has always been a, 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 a father's child, and uh, the son has always been a mother's child. And that's worked well for us. Um, what um, the struggle that we have is getting a little bit worse and worse is that um, when I'm with my son, everything is great. We talk, we do things, but when it's the, the mom and son and, and dad together, um, I might get two or three words out of him all day and he will uh, not want to do anything with me. He'll be upset with me. It's this, and we've asked him point blank, like, why do you behave this way? And he's retrospectively looked at himself and he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And we don't, and we don't either. We can't figure it out. And it's not a healthy sort of situation. So we're, we're trying to figure out uh, even a path, never mind a solution. Yeah. Just like, because you're already curious, you're checking in about it. So he, the dynamic is different when he's with the two of you than it is when he's with just you, dad. Yes. When he's with my, he, he's, 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 he, he's even cuddly when, if she's on a trip, he's even cuddly with me. Have you ever seen him cuddle with me ever in your life? I don't know. Yeah. Right. Never. Right. But when it's just the, the, the two of us together, he'll even be cuddly. Mm -hmm. right? I wonder if there's something. And how old again? He's 15. He's 12. He's, he's 12, 12 and, and he's 12 going on 13. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, going yeah. on 18. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I wonder if some of it um, is this growing up piece, which can happen sometimes with the boys and needing space from mom, but sometimes both parents, right? When it's like I'm now becoming, it's 
that part of that maturation differentiation phase, sometimes more space is actually. But, but he continues to be cuddly with Asta and very affectionate and very close. Uh huh. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's all we thought as well. <laughs> so many questions for that because, yeah, I mean, part of it could be this natural phase again of kind of taking space where space is needed. And sometimes teens don't know why. It's also but it's like, been like this for years now. Oh, since when? Almost always. Oh. Almost. Okay. He's just very much a mama's boy. If but, I'm in the room, he'll prefer me. Oh, okay. To an extreme. To an extreme. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. I think I misunderstood part of the form. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah. No, that's okay. Um. Hmm. Yeah. So there's. He's very connected to you. Yeah. And so that's where he's at right now. You're his safe place. Maybe. Okay. And I think I mean the way we've come to kind of deal with it is I'll just leave the room or I'll leave the area or you know try to have them have as much one-on-one -on -one time as possible but mm. that's anyway yeah and we, it's kind of quiet that's what it happens it changes yeah. yeah 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 maybe there I wonder too part of me wonders if yeah maybe you're his that's what he's comfortable with you're his like safe person in that way another piece could be even maybe his interests are changing or like you know maybe there's things he might want to do um and that could be different with both of you depending on what he's into. And so some of it might be getting out and about, having some new experiences. And and the, I don't know if you've tried some of that, but- Yeah, we have. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Gosh, Thank I see so many more questions. Is there any other bits you could share that are um, noteworthy? <laughs> um, um, I, I, I want to teach him fixing cars or building houses or mm -hmm. racing cars or all sorts of things and his view is well i'll just buy an old house and dad will fix it for me <laughs> oh, i love this okay great so there might even be as i feel into it thank you for that there might even be a little bit of not 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 on your part you're not trying to put pressure but sometimes teens experience what their parents want or like, are even interested in, think would be fun as like, oh, I have to perform or do or learn something or like it becomes, they feel like maybe a little pressure. There there could be some of that too. Um, Cause that can happen. I know lots of teens that are just like, I don't want to break my dad's heart or whatever. Even if it mm -hmm. wouldn't break your heart, there's there's a little bit of that sometimes for some, some young mm -hmm. people that are really sensitive to what their parents want, even if it's all good and would be tons of fun. So that could be something too, maybe with this little bit that I know. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. And if there's more um, specific things to delve into, we'll give um, Kirsten's information too after this and I'm sure you guys can connect. Yeah, I actually offer for every family one free half hour call. So if there's any more, you know, that someone wants to dig through, we can do that. That's great. Um, I did have, I'm not missing a raised hand, right? I um I had a question. Um, my daughter's friends' parents. This is very different from cuddling. Um, my daughter's friends' parents let them drink at their house because they feel it's safer. I don't want my daughter going over, but she wants to be there and gets mad at me if I won't let her go. What should I do? Oh, yeah, this is one. Uh, um, there's another for those. I mean, for all of us here, since we're interested in raising teens. Allie Payne, I'm just going to drop her name because she has great resources too for if you want to just keep diving in. Um, with this particular situation, it's so tricky because it really does depend on like how safe is that house? How safe are those parents? Are they responsible? Um, and, and yeah, it's okay to say no to that stuff. It's okay to have boundaries around that if it doesn't feel right or if it's not safe. Um, and so it's okay to say no. And with that, with any no, I think it's really important to really hear your teen out about what it's like to be them, why they wanna go, why it's important, all that for as long as they need. Um, but it is okay to have, I mean, we need to have boundaries. That's important in any relationship and certainly for young people um, and keeping them safe. However, there's also going to be teen parties, right? And so 
as teens get older, there's like, how do you stay safe when you go to a party? And making sure they have the information so they can make empowered, informed decisions. Um, because there is some scary stuff going on these days that, that, you know, would be helpful to know for anyone to know. And just what those things are, whether it be, yeah, where substances are coming from, consent, and just driving vehicles. These kinds of things are important to talk about. And I think sometimes we shy away from it because it's uncomfortable and we don't know how to have those conversations. And this is, it's an opportune time in the teen years. You're getting your license, your friends are driving this, fam this these parents don't mind the partying. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's like unpack it a little bit so that we're on the same page here. So that I feel good about you going off in the world. And so you feel good to make the best decisions you can because I know you make great decisions. That sort of stuff is kind of where we can go. Um, lots of space, time, and energy needed for these kinds of conversations. It's like what doesn't just boom happen overnight and your teen knows how to make all the best decisions. It really does require so much support and openness and compassion for how hard it is to be a young person right now. And also how hard it is to raise a young person right now. So lots of compassion for yourself too. So when you, when you can't or haven't taken that breath and reacted with curiosity and compassion in the moment and instead just let them have it yeah. and then, and then either regret it or don't regret it, but maybe it wasn't the, this approach. Is there, is there a second step? Is there a comeback? Do you let it lie? What do you do? Oh yeah. I mean, really, of course, as everything depends on the child and really going into yourself and finding the right moment and your truth in your heart. And a lot of, I have seen over and over again, teenagers have the bandwidth and the space to reconnect about stuff. Maybe not right away, depends on the teen, but certainly that, that next step could look something like, I blew up and that was not right. And you did not deserve that. I'm so sorry. Um, and then rebuilding from there acknowledging when we make mistakes that helps um, to model that for young people too so that they know that mistakes happen and that we can grow from them learn from them i think it becomes tricky if it then becomes a pattern right and and if you notice you're in a pattern of yelling and apologizing then it's like who what's that what's that there um what's what's in what do i need to look at here what what's coming up for a reason um because sometimes we do, sometimes we, we yell at people we love and we do, we can come back from that. We can even come back stronger um, and more together. And that's what sometimes I think these tricky moments offer us. It's like a tender, vulnerable space to really model how to do it again, do it in a way that feels better and that honors that person. I even like this concept for people that find themselves in these like tension uh, places. One of the things we can do is be like, I'm going to step away because I don't want to say something I'm going to regret. Because often it's common for adults to say like, you can't talk to me that way and you can't yell at me and you need to go away. And that's, that's I think, really hard for young people because then it feels like you can yell, but they can't yell and they have to go to their room. And it's just, you know, so one of the ways like, I don't want us to say anything we don't regret or I don't want to say something I'm going to regret. So I'm going to take some space, but I'm going to come back in 20 minutes, right? It's okay to have, to take the space and to have those boundaries but not to put it all on them. Because again, they're, they're the child. They're still learning. They need our guidance and that to be modeled. And so that's just another kind of, if anyone's in that, it's one of the ways I think can be to move through that in a way that's still authentic. Cause you don't want to be fake, fake calm or anything. Cause your teenager is going to pick up on that and be like, something's not right. Something's not real here. <laughs> Does anger have a place though? In some, in some instances. Hmm. Sure. Like before, you know, it can help us move through. Asking pain. for a friend. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm asking. Yeah. I'm curious too. I think, <laughs> so. I think so. I think it has a place even it's, there's a difference between like you are bad and wrong and punished and whatever. And then oof, I'm feeling really angry right now. And that's probably because I'm scared. Hmm. Okay. We're in a tough situation. We're just like, we're going to, take some space. We're just going to breathe for a second. I'm going to, you know, get myself together. And also to express that anger where it's appropriate with your therapist or at the gym or in nature, in a pillow, whatever feels good to just move that through. It's when we put it on a child that I think, you know, gets a little bit tricky. 
because that's whatever we feel is ours. And so the more we can model that, the more young, the more teens can start to learn that self-regulation too, right? Through co-regulation. So we get to model this. It doesn't mean we're never going to be upset. We're not going to have emotions. We're all humans and we're going to mess up. Um, if anyone has any questions, Sorry. feel free to put them in the chat. Oh, go ahead. Can I add one? I do have one. Yeah, I think there's also a time and a place for if someone, if they're like, oh, and they're so mad that it's like, oh, this is so hard. You know, we can meet that energy too. It doesn't mean you're like yelling at them. You can meet them in that, oh, and that sometimes feels nice to have someone in that where you can just be like, oh. I mean, it, toddlers are this way, right? They're like, oh, and if you kind of join them and stomp along, then before you know it, they're like giggling on the floor because it helps them move through. So not the teens or toddlers, very different stage, but it is a transformational stage. There is a lot going on. And so giving the message that anger is bad is not what we want to do. It's like, oh, here's what we do with that. Here's what we do with that emotion. Here's how we can move that through and be with that in a safe way. Thanks. Yeah, we do have a question in the chat. I'm going to throw out there. Um, so how would you advise that we help our teens to take the pressure off themselves, as many of them put on academically, athletically, socially? Um, it seems like they're always trying to be better or other or more. And how do we help them to understand that they are enough just as they are? I love this question so much. This is something I feel all the time. I mean, so consistently, just like, wow, how did we get ourselves into this place where young people think they're not enough and they're not already enough and they didn't come perfect? And they're, it's just, ugh, it's heartbreaking, right? And so part of it's, we're in kind of that system, which is what I think a lot of young people are realizing. Um, but the type A ones are kind of in it and they're like going along, trying to be the best of all the best. And, and that has its own set of struggles. Um, so part of that might be, okay, yeah, you want the straight A's, how come, right? Is it the, the perfect college? Um, like learning more about that. And also there might even be space and this isn't for everybody, but this can be for some of the more mature young people or even ourselves where we're, we go, okay, what would happen if, what's the worst case scenario, right? And they might be like failing math or getting a B or, not getting into an Ivy League school or whatever the worst case scenario is and being like, okay, and like going down that and looking at that because sometimes the fear is the part that's we're running away from and it's creating all this tension. And so sometimes there's space to kind of look at that together and be like, huh, oh yeah, what's the fear? What's the worst case scenario here? And then even having that plan B, right? Of, okay, even if that happened, then what? Then what? And being together in that. Right, because then we're not we're not making it better. We're not fixing it. There's nothing to fix. It's just let's be curious together. Let's see what's going on here, um, and and certainly sometimes it's being like, hey, we're in this. This is like a rat race thing. Of course you feel all this pressure. Of course this test feels like the most important thing, and I know that it might be or it might feel like it is because we really want to honor that too. We don't want to dis. We don't want to invalidate that. And so that's why the kind of diving into the worst case scenarios can be part of this. And some teens also really love reassurance. Not all, but there are some that need that reassurance if they're more prone to worrying. It's like looking at the worry, don't avoid it, but also that we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna get through this. Um, that's what I would say for that. Of course, there'd be like more specifics depending on exactly what's happening with this. With, with this young person and what age they are and the, the school dynamics, but they're in that. So like that, that's what the culture is for so many schools. Who's getting the best grades? Who's the all-star basketball player? Who's the most popular? Um, and that can be so intense to be in day in and day out with really no escape. At least all of us, we didn't have phones. We had to like watch it all day when we got home from school or party we didn't get invited to or whatever. There is not really even a break now not even from homework. Some teens are getting that homework assignment on the weekends in their emails. It's like, oof, that's a lot. We had a, a question, I think, going back to when we were talking about phones. What is the suggestion on phone limit? Two hours a day, three for freshmen or high school? My phone is my only leverage. Oof, yeah, of course. It, it can be sometimes. Um, it really... It so depends. There is this whole wait till eighth thing um, that's talked about or wait till 
high school even for just how we think the brains are able to handle this. And I don't know exactly. And I think it really is different for everyone because there's a big difference between two hours of scrolling and then two hours of um, research. And not to say it has to be work-related. That is not what I mean, but how much awareness is part of that. And even, and even sometimes just scrolling, if we know I'm tired, I'm done, or I have a cold or whatever it is, and I'm scrolling because that's, that's my option to feel connected right now. Even the awareness around that can be so helpful. So I get that there's this time thing and there's probably times that are, I guess the less, the better really for any of us, <laughs> like get out in nature and be with people in real life as much as we can. Um, however, sometimes we're on the phone. And so how much awareness is involved in that? Even if it's a video game, there can be plenty of awareness in the video game, plenty of even social connections and growth in video games. I know they get such a bad reputation, but there's, it's like with anything, it's how we're using it, how we feel when we're using it, what's our awareness around it, and, and, and how's that relationship? And do we have other connections in the world? Or is this the only thing? <laughs> is this the only tool? And if that's the case, that'd be good to know because that might be out of balance. Um, I don't have a time frame. So depends. Um, I'm sure you could go to some health website and there would be one based on the information we know. Um, and I lean a little more in the direction of, yeah, why? Well, how come the phone is so important? What, what connection cup isn't full elsewhere? Um, and how much awareness is there? I'd be happy to talk more about the specifics too if, if this person wants to talk more about it. Um, we had another question that was, um, my, my son comes in and I know he's been uh, drinking or getting high, but he denies it and I really have no proof. Should I just drop it? I can't really do anything with him in that moment, can I? Well, teen years are sometimes about these sorts of risk-taking behaviors. And some of it's similar to what we were talking before with the parties. It's like, hey, I'm noticing maybe there's like a smell or a vibe, like being real about it. If one is, if you do want to talk to them about it and being like, I'm sensing something and you're not in trouble. We, I do want to make sure we're on the same page because my head immediately at least goes to safety, right? How, how can you be as safe as possible in these teen years, even if you're taking risks or whatever? Because can't control everything teens are going to do we can however be with a with a relationship we can have influence and when we have influence we can actually inform and empower and stay connected through these tough times so that that would be one option is like i you know you're in ninth grade now or you're a senior year whatever's going on using that kind of as that door or even i noticed last night curious because we might find out they're really stressed out and that's how they're coping. Or they tried it once and they didn't like it. Or, you know, it's this, this huge range of possibilities. And so we don't know unless we step into that world and be that support person. Um, if we kind of just come down hard, which I don't think this person is saying, then we do kind of miss those opportunities. And then your team's less likely to call you when they're in trouble and need help or, you know, something doesn't go well. And we want to really empower them to know kind of how to stay safe because there's some tricky stuff going on in that department these days. Amy, you had a question? You know, I th oh sorry. I think it might be more of a comment. Um, Kirsten, I just feel as though I wish I had come to this chat, you know, like seven years ago. <laughs> and and I think it's really important, or at least I'd like to point out how often you have said you know, that you're in this together, like come to them and be there with them together. Because it puts me back to the days when I absolutely knew I was right. I knew what was right for teenagers. I knew what I thought I wanted to see in my teenagers. And I'm just grateful that the message that you're putting out here tonight is, you know, talk to them sit there with them and learn from them and be there for them, validate who they are and then figure out solutions together. Mm -hmm. So 
it's less of a question and more of a thanks for, I don't know, like how you got to be so natural in all of this or where you come from, but I really believe that what you are saying matters. And I am all about seeing and hearing and validating kids and you are doing it in spades. So kudos. Thank you. I appreciate the comment. Yeah. I think some, we, I think we're just kind of all ready to be heard. And so as you speak about the, yeah, just talk to them. It's like even remembering almost an 80, 20 rule. If we're lucky enough that they're talking with us. Right. And then it's like, oh, drink it in like drink it in because it's it's just it's not necessarily going to last forever in this way for better and worse but I appreciate you saying that I'm glad that it speaks to you I have another one um question so I think for, from the parent perspective I think a lot of parents and, and I think a lot of us are recognizing it are just very much driven by fear kind of an observation that I've made. So I don't know if you could just speak to that a little bit and helping parents kind of navigate that a little bit because I think that's driving a lot of the interactions with our team. So. There's a lot to be scared about. I mean, if we're looking for that and it's easy to do, we're kind of wired that way as humans from my understanding. It's like red alert, red alert. We like note all the scary things because it's like we're, you know, our, we're just trying to stay safe and keep living, right? And so Teens, of course, are a little bit less like that because they've got that, they're like, is the risk worth the fun? You know, that's where their brains are at. So it's like naturally going to be tricky because there's that difference there. I mean, some teens are very uh, super safe and concerned and, um, and there's that too, but generally speaking. So if you're noticing you're like scared, 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 then it might be worth spending time with that scare that scared part that fear um with maybe a guide of some kind or a therapist or someone where it's like what is this and what's the message here and where's my what can i how can i grow through this or how can i even just be in this it's okay to feel scared there's a lot happening in the world and you were trying to keep young people safe we're trying to support them through these years and um and offer them, you know, the best foundation they can with ourselves and then within themselves. And so, yeah, what's it about? And I, and kind of like I mentioned before, there might be space to go, what's my worst fear? And, and spend time in that so that it's not as big. Cause sometimes we can like even trick our brain to believing like, I mean, I, I do this myself personally. Um, when I'm scared of something, I will walk into it when I remember to. And when I have the energy and the right people around and I'll be like hmm and I almost live it so my brain's like oh ah it's not so scary or like I'm still alive or whatever the brain is <laughs> worried about and then it's almost like it happened and we'll notice too our brain will just go to the next fear and the next fear right especially if we're kind of wired in a worried sort of way which many of us are especially after the last few years it's kind of all bubbling to the surface now and it's like what can I say? What should I do? And all this right and wrong and experts. And it's like coming back to actually, we do know, we do know more than we give ourselves credit for, especially when we return to the heart coming from here, moving back down here as we can. And, um, but yeah, part of it's really not avoiding those fears anymore. It's going, oh my gosh, I'm scared. My team's going to make a horrible mistake. And then they won't be able to X, Y, Z, or I'll feel like this, or I'll have to pick up the pieces, whatever that is, and just and be in that and give that some attention and then be like, okay, um, I can handle that. And the brain will, I, I have found that when I do that, it really does almost, it takes almost the power away from that fear because it can be quite stifling, I think. And then probably for many of you, you're have been in this experience and all of us where the fear becomes anger or it becomes like tension it becomes like we're, we're just right on the edge all the time and that can be really tricky especially because teens all children <laughs> are really sensitive to their parents and their caregivers energy this is the first language that we all learn and we don't lose it they're so tuned in and tapped in which is amazing we want them to have a really good radar right <laughs> and so what energy are we bringing to the situation what energy are we bringing into the mix um so yeah i hope that speaks to that question a little bit yeah a fear that's so alive and well or can be and then probably realizing that is your fear and not necessarily their fear that 
you're kind of just projecting. Mm -hmm. Right, because a lot of us, I would bet, or I imagine, many of us didn't necessarily have um, parents that walked into that with us, right? And we're maybe we're feeling like we're doing the work for our parents and ourselves while raising a child. And that's just like, whoa, that's a lot. So it's just big stuff um, to really, to feel. And, and sometimes we need support in that. And that's normal. That's natural, I should say, because what, and what's more natural is having support. Children having multiple safe adults around to help guide it used to be this way. It's like, oh, that, uh, that uncle for fishing, that auntie for this, this, my mom for this, and that group of kids for this. And there was more spread out in terms of like energy and peace and adventure and growth and experiences. And now it's like all on one or two parents in a house. And it's like, that's not as natural. I and mean, it's, it's, it's where we're at. We can totally handle it. And it's natural to need each other and to need support through this because we are social creatures and we need to lean on each other and we need to remember together, support each other. Well, I love this to Amy's, Amy's comment, this kind of like almost investigative reporter approach to when, when your child is dealing with something of the, the curiosity of understanding it a little bit more before reacting and maybe for me personally practicing that a little, a little bit more, that's not necessarily right where I go to so we can practice with ourselves it's like if something's coming up we can do that with ourselves even you know it's like free and available it, you know once we kind of get the hang or maybe have someone guide us a little bit it's it's available to us and we can practice in that way and then it's like oh that felt maybe uncomfortable but hopefully also good in the end and um and then maybe we feel even more brave and more capable to show up for our children in those moments when they're kind of ah and of course they're like ah I mean there's a lot going on and kind of going back to the school thing they I, I can't really um say this enough it's really natural for them to be like this is, doesn't why why is my time being spent like this like leaning into those moments if anyone has a kid that's struggling right now in that way with like the homework or the school or the teacher right it's like leaning into that and really being with them in that if I had to go to school right now for seven hours a day and then have homework and none of it's paid and it's all boring and maybe even the teachers aren't, I don't know, in the best place because teachers are stressed too, I would be so hard for my system if I, if I was a teenager, even if I was an adult. <laughs> so yeah, how can we be compassionate for what their life is like in 2022 um, and ourselves? And maybe as we see also what we can offer our teens, we might then see to what we didn't get and that can be hard too. And so just like holding ourselves in that and hopefully each other too. That's great. We have just a couple minutes. Um, so if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. One thing I, I was hoping to have you expand a little bit on is you have a approach called raising unicorns. And I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Raising Unicorns came about 2018, where it was just really, I was trying to find a way to uh, share kind of this reminder that young people are just like perfect the way they are and wild and unique and there they are and they come here ready and with a gift and they already belong and don't have to do anything to belong. And, and if we can remember that there's this also unique way to work, I think, with this age group, just like with babies, just like with toddlers, like these different stages require um, us to show up in, in a unique way. And so that was the other piece of it. I do have to say it's a little bit, Raising Unicorns is actually growing up. So I'll have more information about what's next and it's exciting. So um, I look forward to sharing that with you too. <laughs> Great. Well, um, well, this has been lovely and thank you so much for sharing your approach and your thoughts with us. And next time we'll come to you. I don't know if I mentioned uh, Kirsten's in uh, Maui. So- uh, Oh, seriously? <laughs> yeah, it's four o'clock right now. Okay, I'm, I'm not a big of a fan anymore. <laughs> You're like, uh-uh. <laughs> no one here, man.
I'm hoping to do some retreats here though. So I'll keep you posted on that too. Um, maybe that gets like half a thumb up or. <laughs> no. Totally. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. We'll be there. Well, thank you so much. It was so great speaking with you. Thank you everyone for spending time with us and um, make sure that you sign up on grit2.org for the newsletter and we'll be sending out information um, about the YouTube recording if you want to see it. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thanks everyone.